we all know how, for example, the ending of Game of Thrones went. Oh my gosh, I was about to bring that up. Yeah, yeah you know, <laughs> I'm sure many people want to rewrite the ending of yeah. Game of Thrones. I started writing fan fiction when I was 11 because I always thought Robin and Starfire were so cute. Do you get any money for your fan fiction? Oh, I wish. <laughs> I wish I did. Hi. I'm Joshua Lin. Welcome to The Library Report, a series where we go beyond the pages of books to explore interesting personalities, fascinating places, and intriguing stories. In this episode, we dive deep into the phenomenon that is fan fiction with a librarian and an educator poet. Where do we even begin to discuss fan fiction? And you may have heard of famous or maybe infamous works of fan fiction, for example, Fifty Shades of Grey. Did you know it is a work of fan fiction? And we have Lisa and Crispin together with me to discuss more about this perhaps misunderstood world. Lisa, Crispin, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Crispin. I'm a poet, I'm a writer, I'm an educator, and I'm really here to talk about how fan fiction has been around for a really long time. I'm Lisa. I'm an early literacy librarian with the National Library Board. I'm here to talk about how fan fiction is actually a significant part of literature, even though there might be those who might not completely agree with that. Now, Lisa, you yourself have been writing fan fiction since you were a very young girl at the age of 11. Yes, that's true. Right, and Kusmin, you yourself also, you're starting to write your own fan yeah, fiction. Yeah, exactly, yes. But, but what is fan fiction? It's fiction that is made by fans. Mm -hmm. So this is fiction that is already existing out there by published authors, but the fans have taken it upon themselves to either rewrite or tell an alternative narrative to that fiction. So if I were to write my alternative story to Harry Potter, um, and I just put it up on a blog or something, and am I considered a fan fiction writer? Yeah, in fact you are. You know, we have authors out there who have uh, written fan fiction on Harry Potter. So mm -hmm. a good example of that is Sufyan Hakim's fan fiction about Harry Potter set in the Singapore context. Yes. So essentially, yeah, that, I mean, that's perfectly uh, called fan fiction as well. Are there some people who like say that you must fulfill a certain or be within certain parameters? You, you cannot change too much of the existing source material, for example, or is it no rules at all? It exists in a spectrum. So you have people who, for example, might want to write an entire fantastic take on that entire genre. Mm -hmm. So you've got alternative love stories between two of the characters, <laughs> and that, of course, breaks the entire canon, right? But you also have people who write um, based on the universe, and they obey all the laws and the continuity of those universes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to acknowledge that both of these are considered fan fiction. For those who decide to create their own characters, maybe they want to feel a deeper bond with the work. Whereas those who, like me, <laughs> prefer to keep to the canon is because I cherish this work. Like, I see the value in it already. I don't want to fix too much that is not broken. So if all fan fiction is based on source material, original material, does that mean that fan fiction isn't 100% original? And if so, is that an issue? The definition of original is very broad because the author themselves, they have their own original ideas and that's why they wrote the book. I had my own original ideas. I am just borrowing the material to set where my idea is taking place. One of my favourite pieces of literature, and it's really very old and really very long, is Ulysses, because it's a complete retelling of the Odyssey, which is a very, very old Greek tradition. It's written by James Joyce, who is long dead, and now there's fan fiction of Ulysses, actually, which is very interesting. So fan fiction of fan fiction? Yes. Wow. In any world, I don't think there's any division between a fan fiction author and an author. Um, largely because literature itself has had a long tradition of people copying, well, copying or riffing from other people. Mm. And so you have, for example, folk tales, and then you have the telling, retellings of those folk tales, which can be considered fan fiction themselves. So while you have someone who talks about, for example, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, you have someone like Sir Thomas Mallory, who's written about 500 years ago, writing a version of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight for his particular age and time. So there has just been there's, there's been this tradition of copying and creating uh, fiction in your own context, and I think that's fan fiction in itself. You know, there's that very famous phrase: there is there are no original works; they're just copies of works. Right. And I think that itself can well, like it, it can assuage you know fan fiction writers. You know that actually what you're doing is just merely being part of a larger tradition of literature. Why? Do people like yourselves write fan fiction? I started writing fan fiction when I was 11 because I think at that age I was very big into Teen Titans and I always thought Robin and Starfire were so cute. 
<laughs> so I wanted them to always be together, just holding hands and being cute together. So I think when you start out young, it is really building these bonds between the characters you want to be together. And in time, you know, you feel, I suppose the term is the feels. You feel emotionally good as you're writing. Then as I got older, I began to understand why exactly I was writing. I felt like there were so many what-ifs and I think that's the golden question with fanfiction authors, the what-if question. We all know how, for example, the ending of Game of Thrones went... Oh my gosh, I was about to bring that up. Yeah, yeah you know, <laughs> I'm sure many people want to rewrite the ending of yeah. Game of Thrones. Or at least for the TV series. The TV series, series yeah. I mean, you're dissatisfied with the character, dissatisfied with the way the story ended and what you want to do is that you want to craft your own narrative uh, such that you you feel that this is the way that things should have fallen into place. There are writers who are like, yeah, go ahead, do what you want. I would love to see your ideas. Mm -hmm. But there are those who are like, you know, this is my baby. I don't want you doing anything to my baby. Mm. But perhaps those people who don't want that to happen is maybe there's some copyright thing going on? For me, uh, someone like Yale James, I would say that Fifty Shades of Grey, if you think of it as Twilight fan fiction, it's you don't see you know, Edward or Bella, you know, instead you see these two other characters and I think part of it is also to avoid uh, copyright infringement and I, there are authors out there who, yeah, I, I guess they, when they realise that the material is something that's publishable, then it goes into that hazy ground of can I then publish it in the world uh, and not incur the wrath of the author who might sue me with, with copyright infringement mm -hmm. and, and, and you, so you have people like E.L. James who have come along and they've done something like that so yeah you know you, you have authors whose copyright has expired because they've died or they've handed over the copyright to someone else or they've commissioned uh, copyrights to, to other authors but you also have authors who genuinely live in fear and then they, they do something else like mm. change the name of their characters and, and so yeah all of this exists uh, I think within the fanfiction community. People write fanfiction for various reasons and it sounds like some people write to publish their works and, and get money out of it but there are people who just write fanfiction for the sake of it and they don't look to monetary rewards for it but they still spend so much time on it. Um, why, why? For example, yourself. Do you get any money for your fanfiction? Oh, I wish. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> because I feel like every piece of fanfiction, I think a lot of writers out there who are watching us right now, they will agree that it's a lot of blood, sweat and tears. I really feel that fanfiction is one of those passion projects. It's really those driven by passion, driven by, oh, I want to make this right in the universe. It's important to know, especially if you're a young writer and you're starting out, that fanfiction is a great springboard. Because I felt encouraged to keep writing when I was younger because I kept getting all this Feedback. And I think that's the heart of writing. I write because I have a story to tell. And whether that story to tell comes from something that I've read before, something that I've seen on TV, something I've played, I am essentially writing my own version of it. And I think that comes from passion. Mm -hmm. A lot of people forget that passion's in the equation when you, when you write. Mm -hmm. So that means that anyone can write. And we must acknowledge that. If you don't have the money, or perhaps if you are writing something that's more specific to your needs, there is also a space to cater to your needs so you don't feel left out and you don't feel like, oh, this is a this is something that only some people can do. Writing is not something that someone can do. Anybody can write. How important is good storytelling in fan fiction? Even if somebody feels like, oh, it's just fan fiction, I don't need to be proper about it, I don't need to obey rules in English. No, you do, because if I read and I cannot concentrate because your spelling is so bad, I'm sorry. I cannot focus. It's like how when you read a good book, you won't be able to keep yourself reading it if you feel like there's too many logical lapses, the inconsistencies. And it's the same with fan fiction. If I don't feel like you're bringing out the best of the character that I already know and love and you're not making good use of the personality they're already given, then I'm not invested. Mm -hmm. What about you, Crispin? You just, um, I understand you are actually writing fan fiction based on Wu Xia. Yes. Which is um, not your typical Western story. Mm. Um, um, so, so this is from, like from, from our Asian world. Actually, is there a difference between Western fan fiction and Asian or Eastern fan fiction? So one of the interesting things that I, I when I told people I wanted to write this story that's based on, on, on Tsing Yong's uh, Legend of the Condor Heroes. Mm -hmm. So when I wanted to write, um, you know, based on that, and I think a lot of people got quite shocked. A lot of people assume that I'm a, I'm a white guy. That's number one. They don't understand that my mom's Chinese. I think one of the things that when I grew up, I was very fascinated with Pusia because that was a part of my culture that I grew very fascinated with that no one wanted to, to talk about it. I was very fascinated, especially with the return of the Condor Heroes because that I started with that first and there were two these two main characters, Yang Guo and, and Xiao Long Yu. And for me, I was like, why the hell is there a seven-foot bird? that everybody seems to be like, oh yeah, that's perfectly normal. There's a seven-foot bird in the story that teaches the main character 
how to do kung fu, you know, and everybody's pretty chill with it. So I decided to go and write, you know, a story based on the Gondor. The reason I wanted to write it was because I was driven by the urge to just talk about this figure. Where did he come from? Why is it significant? In the process of writing, there's so much research. So there's a lot of adherence to good story writing as well. The kind of research that I had to do, I was told by a friend that, okay, you know, all the Western stuff that you've read, be very careful about applying it to Asian storytelling. Oh, you know, in Western storytelling, we're very concerned with things like cause and effect. Things happen because somebody has wronged someone, I take revenge. But, you know, for Asian storytelling, I think it's very different. Things happen because they happen. Why is there a bird? It happens. And so... Just accept uh, it. Just accept it. And so I wanted to write a narrative that also applied those storytelling techniques. And I think so. it's very important that good storytelling techniques are also applied to fan fiction because at the end of the day, it's also very culturally located. If you want to write fan fiction, you should also interrogate that hero's journey. So this is this is where I think good storytelling is also important to fan fiction. Fifty Shades of Grey as a fan fiction, I mean, it is so popular, but how would you rate its uh, storytelling? Okay, one of the good things about Fifty Shades is that the writing is very simple. Mm. So it's very, oh, okay, so Anastasia is like this, Christian is like this, this is how they met, this is what's going to happen. It's very accessible to readers. If E.L. James had not said Fifty Shades of Grey was uh, Twilight fan fiction, I wonder if it would be as successful. So I'm thinking, right, that all these people who've read Twilight and they've listened to E.L. James say that Fifty Shades of Grey is Twilight fan fiction. They've, she's effectively ported over all these fans from Twilight <laughs> to Fifty Shades of Grey, you know. Personally for me, as quality of writing, it's not fantastic, it's not good, but I can understand the mechanism behind it. So, real person fiction, okay, what are your take on it? Sometimes I think what, what results out of it, sometimes it might be some ethical issues, something like John Krakauer's Into the Wild, where you have um, a figure like Christopher McCandler. So, just to give you a, a bit of a, a synopsis, so Into the Wild is about this guy named Christopher McCandler, a real person who um, decided to get off the grid. And so he decides to go, I think, to Alaska, and then he, he goes there and he wants to stay there. There's a very famous picture of him sitting in front of a bus. Uh, he dies by eating some poison berries. I think there's a certain ethical issue because it over romanticizes the notion of what essentially is a man who is trying to get away, but it, it romanticizes it as it's an overly good thing. And I think that sometimes when you when you write real person fiction, you there is that danger of lauding behavior that might be misconstrued as overly desirable. As long as we draw the boundaries, like we know it's fiction, then it's okay, right? It's fiction. A real person fan fiction becomes very um, uncomfortable when it starts to veer away from fiction like you're really just taking the person and you're putting it into a fiction and you're making that person do things with your own characters or with yourself there is a published book called after which is harry styles fan fiction they even changed his name so oh, so see. some people say but you can't really say that's him because it's that's not even stupid. taking his name when it came out and it became a success, it actually caused quite a controversy because people were saying, but this is based on a real life person. How would Harry Styles feel? So I think all the One Direction fans took it a bit personally. Mm -hmm. Whereas people who loved reading this book uh, kept supporting it, saying that it was probably a chance for us to see how Harry Styles would be like in a relationship. I mean, if we can just imagine if people just write about ourselves doing things that we would like, no, that's not what I'll do. It just feels a bit like invasive, right? Oh yeah. A bit yes. And I think I, in, the same, yeah. in the same context, you might, you know, I might press charges, for example, if mm. someone, you know, wrote something slanderous. Mm. So I think that's always the, the, the issue that you skirt around. And I think that's why fanfiction has such a bad reputation because ultimately people think it's very self-indulgent mm. because you want to indulge in a fantasy. And it's fine. It's fine to indulge in, a acti in an activity that makes you feel good. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think, as with all things, everything should be in moderation and you need to know your limits. We talk about people creating fan fiction. What about people who go and read such things? You know, imagine if you liked the story, you liked the world it was in, but you're quite sad that it ended too soon. <laughs> you know, and so what happens is that you go back and you have that immersive experience. Like, I want to linger there a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And fan fiction allows me to linger, which is something that we don't normally think of when it, when it comes to, to other fiction, right? You read a book, you're done you move mm -hmm. on to the next book. It's a way for you to disjoin yourself from reality, but 
it disjoints you to a place that you are very familiar with. I believe another reason why people uh, read fan fiction is also a chance for them to feel represented because fan fiction sometimes is considered like off the grid because nobody actually would go out of their way to look for it unless you are invested in the fandom. Thank you so much Lisa and Crispin for really opening my eyes to this fascinating world of fan fiction. And thank you for watching this episode of The Library Report. Do leave a like and comment down below to share your thoughts with us. If you liked what you saw today, please subscribe and we'll see you in the next one.